This is Pat with Pat's Two Cents with God's Church of Love every Tuesday and Saturday. We've had a lot of uh, technical difficulties, so it may end up <laughs> a lot of people have not been able to get online, and that's the reason. Okay, now we are going to read 2 Samuel chapter 6. Go with me. Now this is the story of how Uzzah had tried to uh, had tried to stop the uh, the ark from falling when the uh, it was on the cart and it, it wobbled a little bit because of the cattle that was pulling it the oxen. Now uh, he was uh, told not to. Everybody was not allowed to touch that ark except for the priests. As a result. He died. He dropped dead. And David was really taken aback from that. It's just a quick summary. David was taken aback. He was scared of the ark, scared of God. He was not a happy camper. He was probably a little bit ticked on top of it. So he decided he didn't want any parts of the ark. And he sent the ark and it sat in a house of a man called Obed-Edom. All right. Now, Obed Edom. <laughs> that ark sat in his house, I think it was about three months or so. Second Samuel chapter 6. Now this is the story of how Uzzah had tried to stop the, uh, the ark from falling when the, uh, it was on the cart and it, it wobbled a little bit because of the cattle that was pulling it, the oxen. Now, uh, he was uh, told not to. Everybody was not allowed to touch that ark except for the priests. As a result, he died. He dropped dead. And David was really taken aback from that. It's just a quick summary. David was taken aback. He was scared of the ark, scared of God. He was not a happy camper. He was probably a little bit ticked on top of it. So he decided he didn't want any parts of the ark. And he sent the ark, and it sat in a house of a man called Obed-Edom. All right. Now, Obed-Edom. <laughs> that ark sat in his house, I think it was about three months or so. And I'm going to start reading. Starting at verse 9. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told King David saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him and because of, the, because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. Now, what that says to me is seeing that Obed-Edom's house was blessed gave David the courage after having seen somebody die for touching it gave him the courage to go on and bring the ark in. And it was so that when they bear the ark of the Lord, had, excuse me, it was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shoutings and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. And they brought the ark. They brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and the peace offerings before the Lord. Now listen, 
And as soon as David had made an end of offering the burnt offerings and peace offerings and blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts, he dealt among all, all the people and among the whole multitude of Israel as well to the women and as men, to everyone a cake of bread and a good piece of fish and a flagon of wine. So all the people departed everyone to his house. When David returned to bless his household, and Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, Oh, how glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. And David said unto Michal, It was before the Lord, which chose me before thy father, and before all his house, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord, and I will yet be more vile than thus, and will be base in mine own sight, and of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. Therefore Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of her death. Now, this really got me. It's a weird story, but this really got me. You got two things going on, y'all. This is the contrast. Check this out. This is the contrast of what happens in our walk with the Lord, in our relationship with the Lord. And this is where people kind of lose out. They forget the details. Listen, you notice how the blessing came on the house of Obed-Edom. Look at the contrast between that and Michal, the, the daughter. I mean, yeah, listen, the one that mocked David. When you look at the blessing that fell on the house, the whole household, the whole family of Obed-Edom, because the Ark of the Covenant was there. Listen, y'all. That represents the presence of the Lord. When you have the presence of God in your life, I don't care what befalls you, it all comes out to be a blessing for you. There's a scripture in Romans 8 that says, all things work together for the good to them that love God and who are called according to to his purpose. We've got to be very, we've got to be very careful not to allow anything to discourage us, not to allow anything to intimidate us because God is on our side and God is in us. He's already in our, we have the Ark of the Covenant right here. That go, that includes all of his promises, his power, his authority, his divine protection. It's all there. The Ark of the Covenant is right in our hearts through Jesus Christ. He is the promise. Now listen, listen, listen. <laughs> When you have God in your life, when you have the presence of God, that Ark of the Covenant sitting in Obed-Edom's house, it was the presence of God, not Obed. It was the presence of that Ark, not the family, not what they did. It was the presence. We have got to learn to practice the presence of God in our lives in every minute. Whether we're watching a movie, whether we're, we're doing something mundane like doing the dishes or taking out the trash. We've got to have God in the forefront of our minds. I mean, he should absorb every part of our lives. The good, the bad, and the indifferent. He must absorb everything. He must saturate everything. He must fill every corner, every nook and cranny of our lives. 
When you are that focused on God, when God is your all in all, when God is your source, when God is your strength, when God is your ever-present help, when God is the lifter up of your head, when God is your healer, when God is your way maker, let me tell you, when God is your best friend, you're in a very good place. You're in a very good place. All the demons in hell can't rise against you. They can try, but they will fall for your sake. They will fall because God's favor is on you when his presence is kept in your life at all times. God should be your number one. God should be your all in all. God should be your focus when you're hurting. It's not the husband or the wife you run to. It's not your child or your best friend you go to on the phone. God should be the first one you even think to go to when you're hurting. God should be the first one that you go to when you're scared. God should be the one you go to when you're in a quandary and you don't know what to do. Oh, if we could understand the value of having God in our lives. God is not your get out of hell free car. Oh. My heart's desire is that every single one of you in our church of God gets to know him in that secret place. You get to know that love. You get to know his presence. You get to know what it feels like to feel his personality right there in your midst. His, to know what it's like for him to keep you company. To know what it's like for him to dry your weeping eyes. There is such a blessing. Such a blessing in having God in your life. Oh my God. Oh my God. There is healing. Listen, listen to what the scripture says. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all of his benefits who forgives all thine iniquities, who heals all your diseases, not some, all of them. Oh, my goodness. Oh, who fills thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagle. The benefits of having God's presence in your life when the enemy comes at you like a flood, the Lord will lift up a standard against your enemy as if to say, talk to the hand, enemy. You cannot cross this line. Go back to hell where you came from. You're trespassing, and I will not allow it. We, When you have the presence of God in your life, you have everything. You have everything you need. You have all the joy you need. You have all the love you ever longed for. You have all the comforts. You have all the benefits, fringe benefits, pleasures, joy, strength, inner healing, freedom. Where the presence of the Lord is, there is liberty. Oh. Joy, unspeakable joy. Oh, there's a song that says, I have found a joy no tongue can tell. Living in the realm of grace, it is like a great overflowing well springing up within my soul. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory over half has never yet been told. Oh, listen. 
practice the presence of God in your life. When you want to complain, praise. In the midst of your tears, praise. Praise him. Remind yourself of his goodness. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh. Listen, 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 listen. Oh, help me, Father. <sighs> Give me a minute, y'all. Just give me a minute. <sighs> okay. I'm going to get it together. I'm going to get it together. <sighs> oh. Okay. Let's go to Psalms 144. I'm feeling led to do that right now. Psalms 144. Mm. Excuse me, y'all. I'm getting a little beside myself here. Okay. I'm going to go back to that. We're not done with that chapter. We're not done with that story because there's some other points I want to bring out. Mm. Okay. Here we go. Starting at verse 11. Starting at verse 9. I will sing a new song unto the Lord, O God, upon a psaltery. And an instrument of ten strings will I sing praises unto thee. It is he that giveth salvation unto kings, who delivereth David his servant from the hurtful sword. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of the strange children whose mouth speaketh vanity and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. That our sons may be plants grown up in their youth. That our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace. That our garners may be full, affording all manner of store. That our sheep may bring four thousands of 10,000 in our streets, that our oxen may be strong to labor, that there be no breaking in and no breaking out, that there be no complaining in our streets. Happy is that people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. All right. I just felt led to read that. There's so many benefits. You just have no idea how much we have in our arsenal when God is in our corner, when God is pulling for us, when God is for us and we are for God. It is, it, 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 oh my goodness, it's, he surrounds us with songs of deliverance. Oh, he covers us as with a shield. There are just so many benefits. We're going to go back to that scripture because I want to finish. I want to finish that. This is where you have to get to the point where you don't give a fly and you know what, what people think about you. When you have been filled up to the brim by God's love, when you've been filled up by his presence, by his glory, by his virtue and his healing virtue, when you've been touched by the master's hand, listen, listen. No human being can make you ashamed of your praise to God. David praised his clothes off. His clothes, he praised himself out of his clothes. He made what my cow saw as a plum D fool out of himself. And David's response to her was, I will be a fool for God in front of the maidens, in front of anybody. He's worthy for what he's done in my life. Yes, I'll be a fool for him. God honors that kind of devotion. 
God honors that kind of love, that kind of reverence, that kind of appreciation of him. He honors it and he makes it known to the world. Your enemy tries to come in. They come in through people. They come in through circumstances. They come in through the demonic attacks. They come in through all kinds of obstacles and opposition. But guess what? What, what does the word say? When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will lift up a standard against your enemy. When you've got God in your corner, when you've got God on your side, when you've got God in your temple, the temple of God, your heart, guess what? Can no weapon from hell prosper? It can't do anything against you. It cannot harm you. You are impervious to the demonic attacks. If you would only believe it, you could receive that. What, God, listen, David, he didn't care what people thought about him. David was the king, not the, uh, the, the one that empties the trash, not the one that did the dishes. He was the king of Israel. And his 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 pride, his his ego never got between him and his God. Excuse me. He fell short like everyone else does. He sinned like everyone else does. He disappointed God like everyone else does. But he knew the goodness of God. And the goodness of God leads us to repentance. David fully repented every time he was called to the carpet. He loved God with an without oh with abandon. He did not care what a fool he made of himself, not for his Lord, not for his God. He'll do that and more. You you think I look like a fool now? I'll, I'll get even worse for God's sake. When you have God in your heart and you are proud of having him in your heart and you love having him in your life and you are you are willing for him to take over and, and, and remove some of your desires to make sure his desires take precedence over your life and you're willing to relinquish some of your rights because you want to please God. Everything you do is, Lord, I want to please you. You know, you, God does not leave that unnoticed or unrewarded. Huh. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. Wow. Let's go to Luke chapter 8. See, sometimes some of our problem is we don't pursue him. Uh, it's just something about the presence of God. I just feel like that is the strongest part of this message than anything else. Wow. Mm. Okay, we're either going to look at Luke 8 or Luke 12. i got to double check here to make sure. Okay, let's see. I'm just going to give a quick, uh, a quick summary of what the Lord showed me. Yeah, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Some of us, we want to be saved. We want to be forgiven. We want to have our needs met. Mm-hmm. That's what children go to Santa Claus for, all the little desires of their heart. God's not Santa Claus. Okay. Sometimes your way up is down. Sometimes the only way you're going to have is to give. Sometimes the only way that you're going to uh, have um, total freedom is to give total freedom, to release those that have offended you to forgive them their debts to you. You have no idea the blessings that come to you when you relinquish everybody else of the bondage that you have the right to hold them at. But when you let them go, according to God's ways, oh my goodness, God rewards that too. Yeah, they may not pay you what they owe you, <clears throat> but God does. God doesn't forget what you have forgiven. God doesn't forget what you have excused. God doesn't forget the people you've released. He doesn't forget any of that. 
I'm telling you right now, as a person that lived her life asking God, why do I have to be the one forgiving this one who owes me, forgiving that one who owes me, forgiving the other one who wronged me, forgiving that one who raped me, forgiving this one for molesting me, forgiving that one for, I mean, yeah, why do I have to do all the forgiving here? I don't regret it one iota. I am living in the most blessed part of my life that I've ever had. Listen, y'all, God rewards every act of obedience when every act is done for his sake. God rewards every sacrificial act of obedience when you have the right to do what you want to do. There are things when you choose not to do for God's sake, not because it's sin, but because it's more beneficial to really do it God's way. Because you want to please him more than you want to please yourself. That's where it is right there. You must want to please him more than you want to please yourself. That's right there. Put it right there. That's the where the rubber meets the road. Who is it you really want to please? You got to grow to get to that point. And growing has pains to it, baby. Ask me how I know. All right. Now, <clears throat> mm, mm, mm. What God was showing me was the woman. Let me read it. This is Luke chapter 8. And everybody mute your mics. Mute chapter, I'm uh, mute. <laughs> Luke chapter 8, verse 40 and on down. And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. <clears throat> and behold, there came a man named Jairus. He was a ruler of the synagogue and fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house, for he had only one daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. Imagine the crowd, like celebrities, when they walk through the crowd and they have all this all these guards trying to stop them from being mauled and mangled by the crowd, just trying to get a touch, a glance, a look. And a woman having an issue of blood, 12 years, which had spent all her living upon, physician, upon the physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him. Now listen to the desperation here came behind him and touched the border of his garment. Do you know how she had to do that? Have you ever wanted something so bad you get on your hands and knees, you scratch your dig, you, you, you go through whatever you got to go through to get your hands on it? I could imagine her not fighting the crowd this way. But the only way she could get room to move would be to get on the ground where there was nothing but legs in her way. And she had to work her way between the legs and the feet to get to the border of his garment. Where was the border of his garment? Hanging near the ground. That's where she had to be. She had to abase herself. No matter what she looked like, no matter how stupid she looked, no matter how desperate she looked, she had to get her hands on her Lord. And her faith and desperation was so strong that healing virtue left Jesus without him participating. Check that out. When was the last time you drew on God like that? Forty-three. And a woman having an issue of blood, 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her issue of blood stanched. 
And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee. And sayest thou who touched me? It's like, really? And Jesus said, somebody had touched me, for I perceived that virtue was going out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and fell down before him. She declared unto him before all the people. She declared unto him before all the people that caused what she, excuse me, for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. Do you know it was a shame to ex to ex Expose yourself. Look at what I did. Oh my God. Uh, this is the reason I've been bleeding all these years. That was a shameful thing back then. That wasn't something you discuss in public. Even when I was a child, you hear women go hush, hush when they talk about their menstrual cycle. Shh. That's not something that you talk about at the dinner table, y'all. You definitely don't talk about that around then. That was the way it was when I was a kid. Imagine back then. That was a shameful thing. She exposed her shame. She was so grateful for the healing. She didn't care anymore. She did what it took to get the healing and then confessed for being grateful for getting the healing. She was like David. She let her shame be out there. She didn't care what the people said. And there were a whole lot of people thronging Jesus. We weren't talking 10 or 15 folks here. All right. So when you see that, there's something that happens in God's heart that registers when a person really stretches their spirit out to, to touch the hem of his garment. When you really stretch to reach the hem of God's heart, when you reach for God with all your might, when you want to get to know him, when you want to get to love him, when you want to feel him in your life, when you want his presence, his ever presence in your life, when you want his power working in you, when you want to know him, I mean, know that you know that you know him and you do whatever it takes and you stand up in church and make a fool of yourself. And you know people are laughing at you because you're so eager beaver because of what he's already done and you want more. You want more of him. You want, there's, I mean, you, you don't ever want the flow to stop. And you've got this joy unspeakable, full of glory and people don't understand that joy. Because they're not there. They don't get it. They don't get you. You're weird. You're over the top. Enough already. Don't you ever shut up talking about the Lord? Don't you have anything else to do? Guess what? You're the one that's going to be blessed. While they watch. Talk about you behind your back. But you're the one that's going to be blessed. Because when you glorify God, baby, God glorifies you. That woman got healed, baby. She didn't wait for Jesus to come to her. She went to him. And she told her dirt and confessed out of her gratefulness for being healed. Hmm. There was a story about the woman with the alabaster box. Yep. That woman came in. I assume she was a former prostitute. She was a woman of the world. The man knew who she was. I wonder how. Hmm. Right. She walks in this man's house. Tears running down her eyes. She is beside herself in worship. And she comes and she kneels. And she's kissing Jesus' feet. 
When was the last time you kissed anybody's feet? Trust me, Jesus wore sandals. His feet were not the cleanest feet in the house. Think about it. He was out there in the desert, y'all. Probably weren't the cleanest smelling either. But that woman got on her hands and knees and kissed that man's feet. She was so full of worship. She was so full in his presence, his fullness of joy. And she's on her hands and knees kissing his feet. Oh, God, help me get this across. <laughs> Nobody knew her name. She was the nobody. She was the one nobody respected. She was the one everybody looked down on. She was the one with a trail of dirt and history behind her. Dirt, shame, sin, degradation. And she brought her little dirty self and kissed Jesus' dusty feet and wiped her tears with her hair off his feet. She anointed him with oil, with this, this expensive oil. The oil represents the anointing. And she anointed him for his burial. Nobody else got what was going on. That was a prophetic act. God didn't have the high priest come and anoint him. He didn't have somebody from around the corner that ran the tabernacle to come and anoint him. This was a nobody, a sinner that came in the act of true worship, clean, pure worship. And when they complained about the waste of the oil and complained, Jesus said, I came in your house. You gave me no water to drink. You didn't kiss my feet. You didn't wash my feet with my tears and with your tears and wet and dry them with your hair. You didn't worship me like this woman. You may look down on her, but I want you to put her in the record. I want the world to know what she did right now. You have no idea how much God honors your worship, your devotion, your dedication. When you have God's favor, baby, to everybody else, you may be a nobody, you may be a weirdo, you may not be worthy of their time or their conversation. But to God, oh my goodness, you have no idea how he values you. Because he values those who value him. He that worships me, this is what God says, must worship me in spirit and in truth. That woman worshiped him in spirit and in truth. She knew who she was. She knew who she wasn't. And the man standing on the side, up there on the sideline whispering. There's always whisperers. I'm going to tell you right now. That's what I believe God is saying. I couldn't figure out how to put these two together. But that's what God is saying. No matter what, if you love God with abandon, you're always going to have whisperers on the sideline that got something to say about you. Got something to say against you. Got some way of mocking you. Like Mikhail mocked David when he danced and praised himself out of his clothes. You're always going to have mockers and haters and whispers. That's a shame. What did they say about the woman? If he was really a prophet, yeah, he would know what kind of woman touches him. See, that word touch had a sexual connotation to it. Look at her touching on him. Look at her hands on his body parts. Look at that. See, the Bible says to the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled, all things are defiled. 
And that man was looking at her through the mind of, of the defiled. He saw dirt. He saw filth. He saw sexual uh, promiscuity. Jesus set the whole record straight with that woman. He knew that it was nothing but pure love, worship in spirit and in truth. And he put her down in the record book. The, the man that did the whispering, yeah, he used him as an ugly example. But he glorified that woman. They may not have thought she was worthy of putting her name in the book, but they still had to tell about her even if they didn't want to. Because Jesus, Jesus, see, God notices things about you that nobody else does. Nobody else values what you got to say. Nobody else wants to hear what you have to offer. Nobody's interested in your conversation about the Lord. Nobody's interested in your commitment to the Lord. Nobody thinks that, that you got anything really all that interesting going on about you. You're just some ordinary Joe or some ordinary Joanne that nobody could care, that they could care less about. Oh, there she goes again. Blah, 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 blah. boy, here she comes. Let's go the other way. I don't want to hear it. Guess what? It doesn't matter. God wants to hear it. If God is your front and center audience, that's all you need. Okay, I'm going to stop because <laughs> I'm so beside myself. I'm sorry, y'all. Listen, calm my little happy hips down. Get to know God. Get to know him. To that point. With abandon. Love him with abandon. Worship him with abandon. Appreciate him with abandon. God is worthy to be praised. Oh, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. stop. I'm going to leave the floor open if any of you have anything you want to add to that. I hope you get to the point where God yeah. is your all in all. And I thank you for listening in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. Oh my God.